You can open in our Bibles this morning to Matthew chapter 4. We'll be looking at verses 18 through 21. And then in a moment we'll flip to, to John chapter 20. So if you want to mark both of those, you can. Or if we just want to sit in Matthew and, and flip there in a minute, you can do that too. We've been looking over the last several weeks at our core values, the core values of our of our church. And so we've covered the first three already. The last one we'll, we'll cover this morning. But who can tell me the first core value of our church? Yeah, our relationship with Jesus. Can we say that together? Our relationship with Jesus. There you go. That's our first core value as a church. It's the first place that, that we come to. And if really, if we had to sum it all down to one thing, that's, that's where we would go. But that relationship calls us to some other things too, doesn't it? The second core value, what's the second core value? The local church. The local church, right? The, the fellowship of, of believers loving one another as the Bible calls us to do. Create that, that community of worship and not just uh, individuals worshiping God, right? Um. And so the, the local church, and then the, the third one we covered last week, what was the third core value? Discipleship. Discipleship. Where we're, we are being disciples of Jesus, we're learning from him, but then we're also discipling others um, in their relationship with the Lord. And then, we've had the papers back here for a while, who could tell me the, the fourth one, the one we're covering this morning? Outreach, Outreach Yes. That's the, the fourth core value. Um, and we even said last week that really it, it's a, a, a byproduct of discipleship. It's part of discipleship, but it's, it's important enough that it's worth standing on its own as a, as a core value. And so we'll, we'll talk about that this morning, <coughs> outreach. And so these are things that we, we've preached this, this series on them, but they're, they're not things that are going away as we... As we continue on to, to other topics in our preaching, every every Sunday we're we're doing these things. Um, every Sunday, essentially, that one of these things is going to be in our message or, or multiple things. Um, so these will uh, continue to be things for us as a church that, that we orient around to help guide our our decisions and our direction. So um, so these things are certainly not things that we want to to leave off. Um, if you haven't grabbed one of those papers in the back, I encourage you to do that this morning. Maybe hang it up on your fridge. Uh, do something where, where you're seeing that. Um, and you'll continue to, to see those in the, in the life of the church as we have, I mean, for, for years and years. This, this isn't anything new either. Uh, so right there in, in Matthew chapter 4, we'll start, I said, in verse 18. is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, earthly ministry. And it says, Now as Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It says, Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left their boats and their father and followed him. And so last week we looked at the first part of Jesus' statement, follow me. We talked about the discipleship. But this morning we're going to look at the, the second part of that statement that he makes to, to his first followers. That I will make you fishers of men. That I will make you fishers of men. Now that's the, the beginning of, of Jesus' ministry. I'm sure when he's telling the disciples this, they're going, what do you, what do you mean by that? What, what does it mean to be fishers of men, right? But he, he says he'll deal with that later. Right now, just, just follow me. So he calls them to that, to that walk of discipleship. But turn with me now to John chapter 20. This is our, our call to worship this morning, but it is the... A statement that Jesus makes to his disciples at the end of his ministry, at the end of his earthly ministry, that is, after he's 
died on the cross and rose from the grave, we see Jesus make another statement to his, his disciples. And there in chapter 20, verse 19, it says, so, the, so when it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, there were disciples, where the disciples were, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Imagine it would be pretty scary to just see a man show up in the room, right? Doors are shut and locked. And Jesus shows up. He has to say, Peace be with you, right? It's okay. Don't, don't fear. In verse 20 it says, And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. His disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And I don't know about you, but I, I would think that as the disciples are hearing that, maybe they're, they're reflecting on their own calls to Jesus in the beginning. They're reflecting on all the ways that they have followed him over the three years, all the miracles they've seen, all the, the questions that they've had for the Lord, all, you know, all the, the curious things that he did and people he went to. They're reflecting on those things, and now he's saying, yeah, just like I did, just like I came to you and led you and you followed me, now I'm sending you. And so that it had a whole lot more clarity when Jesus is saying this statement at the end. Now, they still had to follow him, right? But now they were going to call other people uh, to follow after him. And so just as Jesus was sent out from the Father, now they're being sent out. We mentioned a few times this morning the Growing Young workshop yesterday. And when it comes to this, this topic of outreach in, in our church, in our context, um, I was reading through the book this week, and there was a, a, a section I think that was pretty pertinent to us as a church. But it said one of the potential pitfalls of closely connected groups is that over time they can become shut off to outsiders. Shared life uh, creates such strong bonds that newcomers feel alienated and intimidated by a communal narrative that doesn't seem to include them. But this, this book was saying warm churches keep watch for the unhealthy tendency to grow inward, reminding each other to reach beyond and cultivate fertile soil where new relational seeds can germinate. And one of the things that, that we're always saying about our church is that we are like a family. And that's meant to be like that. But at the same time, we're continued to call, we're continued to be sent out, right? We're continually called to be um, going out into the world and being ministers uh, to people around us to avoid that that inward focus that can happen in a, in a small church setting, right? Because we're not here for ourselves. If we were, God would just take us right up to heaven, right? <laughs> just take us now, rapture us, we're done, right? But he has a purpose for us here in this world. To be sent out, to be that, that salt and light in the world. And so, this morning, I want to talk about three ways that we avoid that tendency, three things that we already do as a church, uh, and three things that we can continue to do as a church to avoid the tendency to, to grow inward that, that small churches can have. So, the first, the first thing, the first uh, uh, guiding principle of this, of this core value is another being statement. If you're taking notes, you can write that word, being. And the, the statement is being an active presence in our community. Being an active presence in our community. And if you remember, we had a, another being statement last week when we talked about discipleship. And that statement said, being living examples to the next generation. Examples of discipleship. Essentially, we are following after Jesus. We can't call people to follow us if we're not actually following after him. So that has to be uh, the, the precursor to this. But when we get to this, this core value of outreach, uh, the emphasis here is, is connecting with the world around us. All right? If we're already connected to, to Jesus Christ in discipleship, we're also called to be connected to, to our community, to our, our world. 
This can be hard, can't it? It can be challenging when we turn on the news or we hear about some things going on in the world around us. Or maybe they're not things that are so far off. Maybe they're even things in our own backyard that are challenging to, to our faith. It can be tempting to want to, to withdraw from that um, and, and to, to just try to maintain our own faith, right? Hold on until Jesus comes. But that's not what we're called to do, is it? That call is still on us to go into the world even though maybe we want to avoid that mess. But think about what that, that meant for Jesus, to be sent out from the Father. You think about the, the glory that he dwelt in in heaven, the, the perfect, unbroken communion that he always had with his Father. You think about the angels worshiping and the glory of, of that, that place. And yet God said, go out. And Philippians 2 tells us that although Jesus existed in the form of God, right? He was always fully God, even when he came here to earth. Although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped. He did not, uh, instead he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. He humbled himself become a man, didn't he? And then, already being a found in appearance as a man, it says that he humbled himself even further by becoming obedient to the point of death. And not just any death, but death on a cross. We see that humility in Christ in Philippians chapter 2 calls us, challenges us as believers to, to take that kind of humility and live it out. It says, because of what Jesus did there, he was glorified and given the name that is above every name. That every knee will bow and every tongue confess that he is Lord. Isaiah 53 tells us that Jesus became despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And then Hebrews chapter 2, we looked at this a few weeks ago in our Bible study. It says that Jesus was not ashamed to call us Human beings, brothers and sisters, brethren is the word there. He's not afraid, he's not ashamed to call us brothers, to identify with us, to, to identify with our, our, our mess, right? He came right into it, out of, out of the glory of heaven, right? And he entered right into, into the mix of it. You know, as Christians, we are continually called to be an active presence in our community. And that's, that's not an option for us, is it? We don't get to, to withdraw if we're following Jesus. We go out, right? We get involved in the, in the mess of the world. Because Jesus has given us a message, hasn't he? He's shown us his light and his life. You know, I think of the, the many ways that we are already doing that. I said that we, we are already doing these things. As a church, I think uh, one of our, our big outreaches is our, our VBS program. Every year we have a, almost 50 kids coming to that, to that program. Um, and most of those are not kids that, that regularly attend church. Most of those are friends and, and friends' friends and cousins. and They're coming, they're hearing the gospel in those places, and that's that's an outreach for us as a church. We've mentioned several times this morning the, the Kids Hope program that, that we do with Deerfield. That's an outreach of a church, a, a place where we're being Christ in in a setting outside of this this building, right? Um, I think also of the the pregnancy care center, the different things that they do, the the walk for life and the golf tournament. Things that we participate in there. Um, the, the YMCA, they have the basketball tournament every year and the church challenge. In the past, we've done the, the Casa Dinners. I've also heard a lot about the Elephant Ears at the 4-H Fair. And um, even, even before that time, the three-on-three -three tournament. I was amazed when I first came to, to church here that... Basically, anybody that I told in the community that I was pastor of Bear Creek, they would say, oh, 
yeah, we, we remember those three-on-three -three tournaments. And I come to find out that was done, like, way back in the 80s. And you're like, this has been a little bit of time since then. But that, that has has given us a name in the community. And so those, those outreaches of the church are important. Someone once said that if your church disbanded tomorrow, who in your community would would take notice? Or would anybody in your community take notice? And I think here at Bear Creek, in this community, they would take notice if, if we closed. I also know that there are probably some people in the community that would not take notice. Both of those are a reality for us, and it continues to, to call us to, to be an active presence in our community as a church but it doesn't just apply to us as a, as a church as a whole. I think it applies to each of us as individuals too, doesn't it? This, this call to be an active presence in our community. Now you think about the number of places that, that we are and we, we walk around in our places of work, our, our friend groups, maybe our extended family or our school community, even the way that we conduct ourselves at the grocery store or a restaurant. Those things are, are us being involved in our community, right? And so what are they, what are they saying about us? What is the, the testimony that we have in the community around us? Not just as, a, as a, a church as a whole, but us as individuals. As we go into the world, are we being that, that salt and light that Jesus has called us to be? You know, that can't happen unless we're being an active presence. Like Jesus, he sat up on the throne in heaven and, and not come down into our mess. Where would we be? And so, as the Father has sent him, so he is sending us. The second way that we, that we see this playing out in our church, the first is, is that we're being an active presence. The second is that we're investing. Investing in opportunities for people to come to the Lord. So first, just being present, but then um, secondly, to, to put ourselves out there, both as a church and as individuals. You know, we, we um, value outreach by making this, this investment in our community, whether it's, it's time or energy or money that we're putting into things. There's a, a certain cost that is involved to, to investing in a, in a community. Um, and if I remember correctly, as going back to, to our M&O retreat when we were discussing this, uh, I think the, the wording behind this particular guiding principle came to us as we were thinking about uh, the support that we give to Quaker Haven Camp and the campers that go, go up there. And it seems like Every year, whether it's the, the finance committee or, or M and L, we always have we always bring up this topic of whether or not this is this is the right way to, to spend the money. I think it's a good thing for us to to pray through, but the discussion always comes back to, to something along these lines. One, if if these kids are are meeting and and growing in their relationship with the Lord at camp. And two, if God has given us, blessed us as a church with the resources to be able to do this, then logically we always come out saying, well, well what, what better use of this money do we have than to send these kids to camp, to give them uh, this opportunity, right, to come to the Lord, to, to know Him more, more intimately, and I think there are many places in which this, this principle applies to us um, of investing in opportunities. Again, we, we think of our, our VBS program, right? It's not just a, a being present, but there's an investment to that with the volunteers that are giving their time, with the resources that it takes as a church to put that on. Um, the Pregnancy Care Center, all the places that we're, we're being uh, an active presence require a certain investment, right, uh, of time and resources uh, into those things. Again, though, the, 
call to invest is not just something that comes to us as a church as a whole, but it comes to us as individuals, doesn't it? Paul said, I have become all things to all men so that by all means I might save some. He had a purpose for, for being present with people, didn't he? He wasn't just being present, he had a purpose for that so that he may by all means save some. So how are we, we taking those places that we already are, whether it's work or, or school or with our families, how are we taking those places that we are already being an active presence and invest in those places? How are we taking those things and investing in opportunities for people to come to the Lord? I like that, that word in there, the opportunities, right? Because, to be honest, you and I, we, we don't, at the end of the day, we can't make people follow the Lord. We can't, we're not coercing people into following the Lord. All that we can do is provide opportunities, right? Show them Jesus in our life. Be available. Maybe it's a friend that you know has a need, and you just say, hey, I'll, I'll be praying about that. And then really pray about that. <laughs> and circle back with them the next day or two or a week, or whenever, whenever is appropriate, and ask them, hey, how's that going? Follow up with them. Uh, or maybe if a scripture comes to your mind of a, of a situation that you're, that you're familiar with in somebody's life, tell them about it. Maybe shoot them a text and say, hey, this was on my mind. Or, or maybe write out a note, depending on what generation you are, right? <laughs> but, but let them know what, what's been on your heart as you're, as you're praying for them. Uh, and there's a lot of ways to, to invest in people's lives. Whether it's, again, any resource that we've been given. Time, energy, money, intentionality. But making that investment takes it to the next step than just being present where we're investing in people's, in people's lives. And the third thing this morning, uh, the third way that we're, we're doing this uh, as a church that we see this play out is inviting Inviting people to plug into the local church, build a relationship with Jesus, and be discipled by mature, more mature believers. And we see all of those core values in this one, don't we? This kind of brings it all, all for full circle. And to be honest, this, this is the point of, of transformation in someone's life. This is the point that... that makes an impact on the world. Because just being present and making an investment doesn't, doesn't call people to make a decision. Doesn't call people to, to change anything that, they're, anything that they're doing. But we want to, as a church, we want to continue to invite people into our fellowship. We want to continue to invite people to, to find the Lord and then lead them in, in discipleship, right? Bring them into to a Sunday school class or just bring them to church for a while. Let them see how you live your life, how you're following Jesus. And then let them learn from that. I want to share with you a, a story that really encapsulates this. And this came from Angela this week. She sent me a text, a praise, really, um, of something that happened years and years ago um, for her. Uh, she said it was when she was uh, between 7 and 14, right? So, not too many years ago, right? <laughs> but she sent me this, this text. She said, I received this text from one of our old neighbors. Mom used to pick them up every year and take them to Bible school many, many years ago. She said many, many years. See, I didn't say that. Um, we must keep sharing his love. She said, I was sitting in church this morning. This is the, the text that she received. I was sitting in church this morning and was remembering when you would invite Jeff and I to vacation Bible school. You don't know how much that affected me to this day. Someone showed us that they cared about us and cared enough to take us. It really was emotional to me because it got us out of that house, which is not a good place to be. And we would look forward and watch the clock uh, until we could leave. 
It was our only way that we learned about Jesus and how he really showed and could love someone that, uh, that they didn't even know, like me. Just wanted to say thank you for caring enough and showing Jesus' love to me. You will always have a part of my heart because you showed a little girl that someone loved her and cared about her because you didn't even know us then that well. Thanks. But man, what a, what a perfect example of, of just being present in the community, of investing in someone else's life, and then taking that step to invite them. Right? And maybe that was a little messy. Because they had to organize a car ride. And and maybe all the, the things in their life weren't, weren't the same and didn't jive with the way that your family operated them. But you brought them in. You invited them. And that life is changed. That world is changed because of that. Amen? Amen. When Jesus calls us to be sent out as he was sent into the world, that's what he's talking about. Just being the salt and light to people around you. Noticing them, investing in them, and then calling them, inviting them to into a relationship with him. So where do you find yourself this morning with this core value of outreach? I think I've asked this with each one of these. When it comes to outreach, this, this core value of our church, are you being an active presence in our community? Most of you I know are. <laughs> You're involved in this community, whether it's your job or your families. And so from there, are, are we investing in the people that are around us? Just, just the, the close inner circle of our lives. Are we investing in those people and being intentional? And then lastly, are we inviting people into our fellowship, into a relationship with the Lord, into maybe a walk of discipleship where they follow us for a little bit until they can find Jesus, right? Would you pray with me this morning? <clears throat> Lord, we thank you for the, the mission that you have given us as a church. Daunting as it may be sometimes, Father. But we thank you for for giving us a part in the work that you have begun and continue to do in our midst and in our world. And we pray humbly, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would help us in that task to continue to be salt and light in the world, to continue to go out into the world as, as you have done in coming to us. And Lord, it is out of gratitude for what you have done that, that we want to to follow you in that. To complete this circle of discipleship by then going out and doing what you did. And so we pray that you would help us in that task. Give us the, the energy and the passion as well as the wisdom and sober-mindedness to go about this task. And Lord, I just pray that you would be with each one of us as we grapple with this in our own hearts. Finding our own step and place in, in this call of God in our life. Where does this play out? And Lord, I pray that you continue to bring these words to us through the week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you this morning. Have a blessed week.